last month. <laughs> Special uh, interests and um, uh, in, in 
fish related things. So among us, and, and they'll introduce themselves, so if you don't already know them, I'm not going to point them out right now, are Irene and Camp Martin of um, Scumacaway. And uh, they worked as uh, gill netters for 40 years on the Columbia. And uh, don't correct me if I'm wrong, tell me what it is. Dick Wallace is here. Are you here, Dick? Where are you? Yes, Dick Wallace is here. And he was a kid during the years of the big salmon derbies. He, so he has stuff to say about that. Bill Garvin great-grandson of P.J. McGowan, and he'll tell us a little bit about early fishing operations on the river and the company town that McGowan was. Um, Michael Meshko has put together uh, a two-minute overview, he said, with pictures of early, Ilwako's early wards, fish wards, and off. And uh, I didn't see Pat Shank, did he sneak in? Oh, I've got to get after him. He might be getting to the forgetful age. <laughs> anyway, he was going to talk about sport fishing. And so uh, if he comes in, he will. And if not, I hope some of you have had some uh, experiences along those lines and maybe some expertise you can share with us. Uh, I also want to say about Irene is that she's an award-winning author and uh, has a lot of um, books in print. Uh, her most recent one is Fly to the Bumblebee, uh, the Columbia River Packers, so Packers Association and a Century of, in the Pursuit of Fish. She's currently working on another book, The Incoming Tide of Memory, a history of the salmon canneries of the Columbia River. But I, she has other books too that are out, and I have to say my personal favorite is the family that never threw anything away. <laughs> it just speaks to me. Hello. <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> uh, and so with that, uh, let's go around the room and just say who you are and if you have a special uh, thing you want to say about fishing, uh, mention that. And then we'll get started with Irene first and uh, 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 whatever going to tell us, I don't know exactly, and, uh, <laughs> and Bill Garvin, they, they have maybe a little conversation back and forth. Okay, so, um, yeah, go ahead, uh, David. Dave, uh, David Olson from Cat Planet. I'm Dale Olson from Cat Planet. Chris Gozer, uh, Wasted Time, Salem, Oregon. And Cindy. Cindy. And I'm Shirley Wilson. I'm this woman's daughter, and I'm from Woodland. I'm Jean Nitzel. My husband ran the uh, 76 stations in Waco during the big fishing time, and all the, the cars lined up clear up the hill to get gas for their boats. It's pretty exciting. I'm Vicki Carter. I like to eat fish. <laughs> Sydney said uh, this week uh, Mrs. Glenn died, and uh, my understanding from the tour I did with Rex C is she was instrumental in saving Teal Slough and making it possible for people like me to, to drive to a spot where I could walk in among these giant uh, western red cedars primarily. Um, and that's a gift she's given me. I never met her. And yet, and it's not that I read a book or wrote anything, it's that she gave me this, as well as Mr. Z, this enormous legacy that is really transformative. If you walk into that uh, among those trees, you're just not the same. <coughs> and the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. She did so much work on that, too. Uh, I'm Debbie Halliburton, and you know, we were talking about logging last time and fishing this time. And, you know, everything that has to do with this area, if anybody's got family here, that's all they did. I mean, that was something that was a big part of their 
likes. And um, just for a little anecdote, um, I took my mom before she died to the Columbia Maritime Museum, and they have the displays of all the boats, and Irene knows this whole, all about this stuff. But she was pretty old at that time, and there, there was a chalkboard up on the wall in there that was a display, and it was the drift. And they put their names up, and it's chalk because it changes when you draw where you're going to be in the drift line to go fish in the river by Kaplan, but mostly in Stamakali too. But when she saw that, she looked at the board and she was like, oh yeah, you know, Marinka Bish, yeah, and then she just read the names off. But to her, that's not history, that's just people she knows. Right. They're probably all dead, but I mean, <laughs> she knew them. And the guy who was, one of the docents was walking around, he looked at her and said, do you know those people? And she looked at him like he was crazy. You know, like, well, of course. You know. he goes, oh, can I talk to you for a minute? But I mean, this was their life and all of that. And so I think fishing for here is really important for everybody around. They want to know the history. Fishing's in there. Uh, my name is Don Moore, and I live in Hillsborough and uh, part-time in uh, Long Beach. My name is Pam Beezing. My parents uh, moved here as I was going off to college. So when I came home, in the summers I worked down in the charter offices and uh, for sports fishery for a few summers. So that's the closest I came, besides eating fish. <laughs> yeah. I'm Steve Rogers. I grew up and lived in South Bend. I'm a retired high school principal and moved back home in 2000. Um, I'm the son of a son of a daughter. And um, just to note the, the power of, well, those of you who follow the Historical Society, mm -hmm. uh, I know that we have a Southwestern magazine. And it ends up that I've been the sole author, writer, producer, publisher, designer of the magazine. And I'm a year behind. I had a magazine block. But the, the dam burst after Mr. Knott's presentation last week. And I've turned that so far. I'm on the 20th page of the New Southwester that is uh, drawing on his expertise. It's really interesting when we put it all together. So I have to do some, uh, a few things with photographs and uh, put together a cover and a back sheet. And I'm our, our annual meeting this year is going to be the first Sunday in April at the Blue Harbor Golf Course. It's called Riverview Golf Course, I think now. Um, but the clubhouse has been remodeled, and it's um, we're not going to we're not going to feed everyone <laughs> at the uh, Token Hotel again. Um, we're still digging out from that. No, it's fine. Uh, it was a goodwill gesture to welcome our members. It was a great program, but uh, Sydney was such an important part of that. So I'll quit chattering, but anyway, I'm, I'm pleased to announce that finally people will quit coming up to me and say, did I lose my son? <laughs> <laughs> people are very polite. <laughs> I don't say you are, so thank you. part in doing the next Southwestern. I mainly got one out of a, a history forum, so... Oh, I have another one halfway finished. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, did it come from a history forum? I mean, I'm putting no, pressure... Well, I'm putting the pressure on these people. <laughs> this is our a document and you... You write it, I'll publish it. <laughs> okay. What about you? I'm going to go. Oh, sure. Go uh, Bill Garvin. Uh, it's a time between Astoria and McGowan. Uh, love being here. Uh, obviously, uh, deep roots in the area, but also love fish and love to fish. Um, uh, really want to applaud everybody about this forum, Sydney and all her colleagues. Um, great forum, great format, great venue. And so, just glad to be part of it.
Michael Omeshko, and I'm, uh, one of my jobs here is to be the IT guy, totally unqualified. But I have learned a few things, and one was how to put these videos up on a YouTube channel. So um, the first ones are kind of crappy, to be honest with you, because, you know, it's a learning curve. But uh, the latest ones are actually getting better. You can actually hear what people are saying. And so I've learned to put them, upload them, and they're up there for you to look at if you you know, if you want to look back at something, they're there. Um, hopefully this one will turn out even better than the last one, so we'll see. But anyway, that's, that's me. <laughs> Rick Bales, uh, relative newcomer to South Bend, been there since, well, 17 years. Um, I was thinking about uh, just one short recollection I had a number of years ago. Uh, we went over to Cold Center, right? and one of the things I do is when I go over taking a trip like this, <coughs> I take along some remembrance, some things which will be a remembrance of my being there, and I took over uh, several tins of uh, oysters. Oh, oyster cap in the world, right? Well, I got over to Colchester and found that it was the oil capital of the, uh, the uh, oyster capital of the world. <laughs> It lends a whole new meaning to taking coals to Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Duchar. I'm currently retired in Ilwaco, though I've lived in various villages up and down the sand spit. Um, my direct experience with fisheries is almost zero. However, guilt by association has brought me many, many, many interesting stories not the least of which is I am a volunteer at the Napton Cove Heritage uh, Museum uh, past the, the regular bridge between miles. It's uh, by appointment typically, although we do have open hours in the summer somewhat. And uh, I've lived near the harbors up and down the west coast and it just it seems to be part of my life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rose Fowler. I've lived on the outskirts of Long Beach for 20 years. I grew up in coastal New Zealand and fish mania is down there too. Uh, when my dad had a day off, his, his ideal was to get in his boat and head for the horizon, anchor by the black rocks and fish until he was up at his knees <laughs> and then come back and clean them on the beach and as a child with my brothers and sisters, I can remember carrying strings of fish along the beach, accosting perfect stranger tourists and saying, would you please take these or our father will make us eat them. <laughs> I also brought a map down that I acquired at uh, Bayside Tra Bay Traders. Uh, it's a map of the peninsula uh, between about 1930 and 1937. Check it out, there are some big changes. Ask Sydney about the, the top end where Toblin is that um, isn't there anymore. She told me once there was a lighthouse and her grandfather was the lighthouse keeper up there. For a couple years. Yeah. Yeah. It's long gone now, floated away. Anyway, check it out. And Pat Paulson lived out there too when he was a boy. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that gave him a sense of humor or not. I'm not sure. But yeah, crazy. I'm Madeline Kalbach. I am, am from Calgary, Alberta, and uh, but I spend half of the year here in uh, this community, and I love it. My connection to fish is that I love the birds 
that eat fish, I write about them, and then take their pictures. The <laughs> 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 I'm Susan Stauffer, I up here, Oysterville, kind of. Um, I lived on the Washougal River um, for about almost 20 years and was fishing there. With, and there was a salmon hatchery up above as well as a steelhead hatchery. So it was kind of somewhat easy pickets, but not totally. But it was land, you know, fishing. But uh, what I could never get over is the silvers would come in the fall and they wouldn't even have sea lice on them. They would come from the ocean. 100 miles up that Columbia River, be up in the Washuba River, and I just, how they did it is just, to me, is that's what just, well, I love fish in that sense, besides eating them and smoking them, but that was my, I, and I always hate to them. So anyway, that's my quick connection to fish. Um, but it's just to me, the, those things, those fish are just amazing. Hi, my name's Mike Marker, I come along with Jeff, and we find a newcomer to the walk and I just come along with him as a friend. <laughs> That's good. And I'm Jeff Freeman. Um, I'm a descendant of Kong Kong. I'm a descendant of Kong Kong. I'm related to uh, Tro Pan, Jack and Tro. Sent me to Washington, D.C., and anyway, I've been uh, staying at Robin's Library, um, which is National Library in the Waco. And I'm writing a book of, it's titled 200 Years of Peace and Friendship. My name is Robin Taylor. I live in Milwaukee and uh, I'm a librarian for the Chinook National Library. And uh, our family is Chinook and we've been involved with fishing all our life. Uh, my grandfather had a troll fishing salmon troll, troller in Milwaukee Harbor, and, and, and as, as work, he, he worked as the Indian fish buyer for J.P. McGowan. Hmm. And uh, my father was in the Coast Guard for 26 years, but when he retired, he operated a salmon charter fishing boat out of Milwaukee called the Milwaukee Indian, and uh, still has the record for the the most successful carrying of passengers out into the ocean fishing. Uh, I got involved with fishing when uh, I uh, was declared a, uh, a, a persona non grata for refusing to go into the Army because I was a conscious objector. So my career as a, uh, at the University of Washington as an architect was stopped and I had to find some way to get by for a while, so I spent a few years fishing out of Illawakal in the mouth of the river and then up to Alaska and around, and finally I was able to get a job in a large fishing vessel, get some Coast Guard certification, and get away from fishing, and spent my 30 years as a merchant mariner, as a helmsman on the ships carrying containers around the world. But I, I was, my, in, connection with fishing, I was uh, appalled by all the terrible habits of the management of the fisheries that had so much waste and, and, and destruction in the fishing industry, the, the ground uh, uh, nets and such. Uh, I was glad to get away from fishing because I, I, I was on the side of the fish. And <laughs> when, when, when my, I, I, once in a while I helped my father out on his salmon fishing boat and, and he'd have people out there, of course, looking for, and someone would get a really big salmon on, and I, I'd be out on the stern to, to net it, and I would purposely hit the line and knock the fish off, and, oh, I'm sorry, I wanted the big ones to go up river and spawn. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, I'm Patrick Smith. Uh, I like fishing. Um, uh, I am a reason why it's called fishing and not catching, though, because more often than not, I get skunked. Um, I, I remember one time I was down the Klamath River with a guide, me and another a buddy was. There was 500 drift boats there near the mouth, with probably a 1,000 people bank fishing, fish coming everywhere, and crickets. 
<laughs> on a whole boat. I ain't jinx anybody that's with me gets jinxed. So you would have liked it. I, I, more often, probably 90% of the time I go fishing, I come home with a wet butt. And it <laughs> I'm Dale Michael from Ocean Park. Just moved here in August. Yeah, I'm Piper Watson. Uh, we used to go fishing with Bub Baker. Anybody remember Bub Baker? He had the jag one down there at uh, slip number one in Iwaco. And uh, God, he was a great guy. Really enjoy remembering him. So here's the Bub. <laughs> I'm Karen Clark Gray. Uh, my family, five generations of Gilmetters County, my two sons. Um, Debbie was talking about thrips. My dad, 95, can probably name, well, he can name all the thrips. He can probably name most of those people on those thrips because he remembers all that. And I was wondering, we should make that list, I read. You know, yeah. that's, that's a lot of people involved. A lot of people involved. So I think all the way from Bonneville Dam almost down to the lower <coughs> end would have been Altina Maker area, I believe. Yeah, that's a lot of river. This well, is a real camaraderie, too. I mean, you know, it was important to them to be in the drift. Yes. Oh, right. I mean, yeah, there was, there was a reason there was a group, and usually they lived close. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there was some infighting in the oh, well, well, there, there was, was in the yeah, and there's infighting for people that weren't paying into the drift that oh, right. went out and tried to fish there. Yes. Well, um, yes, you had to do your work. Came out there. Right. You had to do your work with snagging, <laughs> and you had to do your snag. work, or else you had to pay. Yeah. And then if you didn't work and you didn't pay, then you were in trouble with the rest of the. They, they had a captain. Captain took care of all that, supposedly. And you couldn't just go across their area. No. Willy-nilly. Right, willy -nilly. yeah. 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 So What's the definition of a drift? Thank you. Candace yeah. actually going to get into that and just, oh, good. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah that, could, that, could, that could take a time. A little time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One more here. Is everybody? I'm Dick Wallace. I grew up here in Milwaukee. Uh, my family grandfather, uh, Ray Provo, he had the Durbanville area, which I'll speak a little bit about that later. Um, I was just a little shaver at the time when Durbanville was gone, but it was a lot of fun to uh, go down there for that one, about a month of activities going on pretty heavy. And, and of course, I caught my first fish, first salmon right off Durbanville, so I, was, I remember that day pretty good. <laughs> Vaughn Newcomb. I'm living in Long Beach. I decided to retire here and find out what the community is all about. Colleen Sheehan. I live in Long Beach. I like to eat fish, but I'm not a fish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I think we'll start with you and uh, and uh, Kent and and uh, Bill, as he can wade into that, and then we'll just go from there. Uh, and those of you who have uh, special things to say, um, weigh in, or if it looks like uh, uh, you're not weighing in, I'll weigh you in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here, number one. Thank you. I was not expecting this many people to show up today. <laughs> And it's a little chilly, and it certainly was our way, too. What I decided I would do was bring some things along with me, the old tools of the trade, uh, to give you sort of a, an idea of what it looked like and what it felt like. And I'm going to start with this, and I'll see if anyone can guess what it is. A horn. <laughs> that right? What kind of horn? Foghorn. Foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> if you're fishing a sailing vessel in the fog, you need one. <coughs> because other people are out there too in sailing vessels, and they're going to be doing the same sort of thing. And you need to be able to locate yourself, both in the daylight and in the dark. So that's number one. Actually, Lewis and Clark.
Clark had horns very similar to this when they came along too, which was a surprise. They wouldn't have looked as good as this one does. But anyhow, it's a horn, and I have also used it in times when a meeting gets rowdy. I will blow the horn. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
I, I'm told there's a fictional, fictitious story out there that someone tried dynamite. <laughs> but they use bayonets a lot to open a can. So it's really no accident that that looks remarkably like a bayonet. And that's how they started opening cans. So I'll pass that little can. I've been through a lot of injuries opening cans. <laughs> <laughs> there was one wonderful invention. I saw a picture of it one time. And it was advertised so simple a child could have used it. And, and, yet, and then the injury story started coming in. So I realized that that was the 1870s with that. And I'm thinking probably a lot of children got very badly hurt with that, not to mention the adults. So that's the first thing about canning is you have to have a can opener. The other thing was the competition. As the number of canneries grew, people were competing. And really the only way they had to compete was in advertising. And a lot of the advertisement was can labels. Beautiful, gorgeous can labels in those days. And I'm going to pass some of these around. Uh, the J.G. Magler Company, uh, Joe, Joe Magler had married a woman, Nellie Smith, from Brookfield, North Mass in Massachusetts, North Brookfield, it was. And they had a cannery at Brookfield, Washington, named it after her uh, home, hometown. And she came up with the idea, along with her Chinese gardener, of doing floral labels for salmon. So this is a copy of the uh, forget-me-not label. I think they had golden poppy uh, and two or three others as well. Golden poppy was one of those, I'm trying to remember. There's forget-me-not and then fancy brand, I think, another one. No, Glendora is the next one I'm going to pass around. This is J.G. Hanthorne and Company. And it's the Gladiola brand. To me, it's the most beautiful label I've ever seen. And these were expensive to, to get. You know, gold and silver inks, this type of thing and everything. The silver was actually zinc. But nonetheless, absolutely gorgeous labels. We don't see anything like this now. And because the other cameras rapidly realized, the other packers realized that only the best stuff was selling my hotcakes because of beautiful labels. She found a way to appeal to the housewife. So they all followed suit, and eventually they outdid her, but I always thought that was wonderful. She did another wonderful label for a Brookfield cannery. I actually had a can at one time that had it, and she had recipes on the back. And it's the first can I've seen that actually had recipes. And the first piece uh, on the top of the can where the recipe label was, it says, never buy cans that are bulged at the ends. And I think, what a nice housewifey thing to do, to tell people not to buy bulging <laughs> cans. Another brand name uh, was Pillar Rock Packing Company. And it has a wonderful uh, the Pillar Rock feature on it, with a smokestack industry in the background. And a uh, little sailing vessels going around the rock, like a kind of a merry-go-round type appearance. The other one that I have is Boss Brand, also from Pillar Rock. That is an engraving of uh, the owner at that time, John Harrington, quite happy looking. And I think that this is kind of a vanity label, a very early vanity label of John Harrington, his camera, and his, his, his engraved picture. My final favorite label, and this will give you an idea also about the kind of competition, because by the 1880s and 90s, you got staggering numbers of immigrants coming into the U.S. from all over the place. And here is this wonderful Beacon brand label. And there's the Statue of Liberty in it. Behind her is the Brooklyn Bridge. So this is New York, right? And the Statue of Liberty has a salmon. A glowing salmon, right? <laughs> and a scroll. But it's not a scroll, it's a can tucked her in, in her left elbow. So do take a look at the Statue of Liberty as a basically come on for the salmon industry. One of my favorites. It wasn't all interesting stuff like this. There was a dark side as well in the canning industry, and that was the labor issue. And the part of the um, problem was that there was a huge labor shortage in the 19, or 1860s, 70s, and 80s. 
And as a result, you had uh, a lot of um, people being brought in as indentured labor uh, for some of the canneries. You also had Chinese people being brought in by canneries uh, uh, <coughs> in order to work on the canning lines. And that the Chinese story is really a poignant one. Uh, to give you a little bit of this, an idea of the background here. Uh, during the 1860s and 70s, there were tremendous floods in China, particularly in Guangdong province in China. And those floods basically washed out a huge amount of agricultural land and farms. And you had people that lost everything, absolutely everything in that. And so young men that from there were recruited to come over to work in the canneries and the railroads and various other places in order to, and they came because they lost everything. A farm that they might have figured on inheriting from the parents did not exist anymore. And as a result, they were they're very young for the most part. Uh, in going through some of the census material, which there's not a lot of, a lot of times when they were doing a census, they would name all the people in the town, and then they would say 78 Chinese laborers. Um, no names, no ages. But when you do look at the ages, you're looking at you know, 16, 17, 18 um, high school kids basically coming over because it was a way to make a living. And they didn't get paid very well um, in everything. And this picture is from the WB, uh, or CRPA, uh, Canary, in uh, Astoria. And it shows you a child working in that canopy. And it gives you an idea of what the hard times were that pushed a lot of people over here. Uh, immigration is kind of a push-pull type thing. You get pushed out by something like losing everything, or famine, as happened to a lot of these Scandinavian countries. Uh, people were pushed out by the famines in Sweden and Norway uh, back in the 1860s and 70s. And they get pulled in to a place where it looks like they've got a better job. So those are a couple of the artifacts I brought with me. And I'm not going to pass the can around um, because I didn't show you the lid. <laughs> someone labored to get that lid off. And I think it's very sharp. And so I don't want to pass that around for people to handle. But you're welcome to come up later and look at that. The other items I brought is a sailmaker's kit. The early can or the early uh, fish boats, your salmon vessels. And so they would have had sailmakers kits here with everything from wax to wax the twine with, sailmakers palm, and then I've got some needles in here as well. And again, you're welcome to come and look at that uh, if you wish to. I did bring some of my books for sale later if you want to do that. Um, and I've written a lot on fish farms, in part because I had the wonderful opportunity to be involved with fisheries. And it's taken me in a variety of directions. Um, one was of looking at it as an occupational community. Uh, we tend to think of communities as being groups of people uh, living in a particular area. There are also occupational communities, and the Gilnet Fishery on the Columbia River is one of those communities. When you talked about knowing everybody, of course you do. You know everybody because you work with them. You talk with them, you do business with them. You're going to meet them again in Alaska when we were fishing in Southeast Alaska and Bristol Bay. You would meet people from the Columbia River. So it's a community that basically spreads from Alaska through to California because people have different communities to fish different uh, areas. So it's a community. The second thing is, a lot of fishing customs have been in place for thousands of years all over the world. And so that took me back into researching the fishermen of the Bible, and who, many of whom were disciples of Jesus. And that also took me into finding out about, more about canning, and just a whole lot of things uh, that fishing it takes you down a lot of paths, so to speak, in terms of looking for information. I'll end my part of the talk with uh, one of the uh, fun parts of fishing that we had. 
I, it's fun now. It wasn't fun at the time. <laughs> um, it, Ken and I were putting the boat in at Nakata one time, many years ago. We fished a little bit for a brief for a period of time. Our boat, unfortunately, in my view, was named the Floozy. <laughs> <laughs> and so there is the Floozy, hung up in the air there, just about to be lowered gently into the water. And there was a tourist couple standing nearby watching the whole thing. And finally, one of them turned to me and said, do you know anything about this film? I said, yeah, my husband and I own it. And she said, was she named after you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to live with that for the rest of my life. <laughs> and every time someone sees that boat, the question comes, was she named after you? And usually I preempt the conversation and say, she wasn't named after you. <laughs> So, you can take this out into the universe. The floozy was not me. <laughs> now, stop here. Kim is going to talk about drift rights, and then we'll hopefully answer your questions. Let me just add that uh, I've only owned one fire glass boat in my life, and if I was going to continue, I'd probably never own another. A boat is a personality. It's probably the closest thing to a wife. Do you sleep with it? Do you live on it? You learn how it smells, how it feels, and if you find it, it comes apart. Now, to the issue of the drift rights. By the way, I teach them this morning. I said, looking around at the age of the people that are here, your talk is going to be peer reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, I can. Anyway, uh, I had. Three drift rights, uh, it's Kamakawe. But the whole idea, and they really, I think, took hold in the 20s. It's a section of river bottom that a group of fishermen get together and clear. In other words, clean the bottom of snags that's going to rip the gear up. They probably got started somewhere around 1900 maybe a little before that, but they started closing them, in other words, excluding others about the time that power boats became much more common and fishermen could move around. And guys were saying, you know, I, we had to hire a diver. In those days, it was a hard hat diver that you pumped air to. And usually, at least in our community, you had a big float two big fur logs with a fair lead at one end and a hand crank winch at the other. And the, the diver basically <coughs> went down in slack water or fixed a cable to it and you put it down and in some cases if the snag didn't come you would let the tide raise on it and would pull. So anyway, this was clearing grounds and basically when it got the ones that I had, the first one, was uh, was called the Gut Skamakaway, and I had the Skamakaway Channel, and I had a three three point. But anyway, I was told the oral tradition said that was started around 1908. I started clearing it, but they organized it sometime in the early 20s, according to my relatives and ancestors. But the whole idea in, is to control not how many fish you catch, but access, how many fish you catch is up to you. And there are good fishermen and bad fishermen. Some fishermen couldn't catch fish in a rain barrel, and there's others, you know, wonder, they're wizards. Usually a really good fisherman's got a mind like a file in a You can pull out a little three by five card and say, especially in wide ranging places like Bristol Bay or even in the lower Columbia area, and say, about six years ago, Back in 68, we had tides like this. The river was about the same. Water was, temperature was cold. I think fish are going to be over there like they were. And it's amazing. I, I've known people like that. And it's like they can pull out something out of a filing cabinet. And there's a real thing to that. But one of the things that you give up when you're fishing a drift right then is basically you wait for the fish to come to you. And uh, some drifts are better than others. But it is not 
controlling their or catching the fish yourself, it's actually the, act, the actual catching is up to you. And I found this out when I was in Newfoundland because one of the things that I studied there was the inshore cod fishery, uh, particularly the trap fishery. And they drew, there was a, the section of coastline that I, where I uh, lived and, with fishermen, was very rocky like most of Newfoundland is. There's only so many places where you could set a trap for cod. They come into the beach when the, uh, in June, usually in July, there's a bait fish called, called capelin. They're about like a smell. And they spawn right in the surf of the beach and the cod follow them in. So you set traps with the lead running into the beach and the fish follow that and go into your trap. But in this community that I was in, there was only, I think, eight places where you could set a trap and get it back in one piece. Mm -hmm. In other words, where there wasn't reefs and rocks and stuff that was going to tear you up. And of those eight, there was about three that were really keen on. The others ranged from okay to last resort. Anyway, so they drew for that. Just like you draw for order of fishing on a, on a drift ramp. We drew numbers. Some places they had a blackboard up. We drew numbers out of the hat. But anyway, what I found so fascinating was all the, the tension and inveigling that goes on over being one of those three or four really keen old places. That would make your summer. Uh, and if you've got another one, well, you have to, a lesser one, well, you'd maybe make it up in the line, long line fishery in September, you know, October. Uh, but that June, July, early August trap fishery was what really made the money. And anyway, so it wasn't because there was differences in how guys put traps together too. Just like a gillnet or even trawl long line here. Uh, there's some people who are a lot better at it than others. So just because you've got the keno site doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get catch the fish. But it levels the access. The fact that other guys are different, maybe not as good as others, well, that's their own responsibility. And that's the key difference. Uh, but anyway, the whole drift right thing I had, uh, you draw numbers, and it wasn't as contentious as what I saw in Newfoundland. I saw some huge rows over that, and where people would try to say, well, I don't think those numbers were drawn right. Maybe we need to have, have uh, another draw. It was so contentious that when I was there that the Newfoundland Department of Fisheries would have the fishery officer come down and preside over it. I was never to one of these meetings. I didn't want to get that involved, but the fishery officer whom I knew told me, he said, people never address each other face to face where you might end up in fisticuffs. It all went through the fisheries officer. So they would say, well, he said now this, I think this, and the other one would say, yeah, you know, no. So in, in to order to diffuse these things that might make your whole season. So that's why drift rights are important. It's, it's access, and you clear the grounds. Some drifts are much more difficult to keep clean. One I had was very difficult, where you have a climbing bottom, and you're climbing out of deep water, stuff rolls down, and tends to sand in, and you're pretty busy at it. So, uh, we didn't have much problem after we closed our drifts. They were organized in different ways. The Finns, with their socialistic idea, uh, all used to have to pay in at the beginning of the season. That was up around Class Canine Mayor. And then if you went, when you went snagging, you drew what, a portion per day that you snagged back out of the fund that you paid into. And if you didn't show up, you didn't get the money. Other places we find people were fined or not given a number if they didn't show up. And usually guys were pretty good about showing up because if they, you know, because this is all community and there's all this tension between you got to get along, but you're also fearfully com competitive. Uh, one fisherman in Newfoundland, I think, said it's the difference between doing your fellow fisherman dirt and being a damn good slippery fisherman. 
<laughs> in other words, getting him to do the job on himself instead of you. So you can say, well, hey, not my problem, not my fault, I didn't do anything. Not my problem if you tripped up. So anyway, that's, that's all part of the community dynamics and why drift rights were a way to try to organize and rationalize uh, access to a resource from, for people in interacting with people that you might uh, have kids in school, church, all kinds of other community things. And this was a way of kind of smoothing it over, that kind of veneer of egalitarianism, so you could still work with that person even if you knew he was a, not a very good fisherman or vice versa. Is that okay? I have a question. <laughs> How large were the drifts? Were they like miles uh, long? Or? They were about uh, 250,000 wide. Same way. 250,000. You know, between uh, a little over a quarter, half a mile. You know, and uh, I know some that were a couple, three miles long. Mine were about a mile. And were they as wide as the river? Or? Uh, some of that was you know, the width of the river, but normally most people fish, you're only allowed 200 fathoms, or two, 250 fathoms on the river. Oh, um, yeah. Of that. So that's a, about the width. It's a little, because maybe you might want to fish more on one side or more on one edge, so as you pull snags a little wider. But normally they were milder, a little longer. Uh, the Altoona Pillar Rock, uh, it started out as a bunch of small drifts, and they finally totally organized it into the Altoona Snag Union, and wherein you had 12 drifts, and so instead of keeping track of all of these numbers and little in a book, which I had, or a, on a blackboard, what they did is you would go to the top of the drift where you wanted to fish every uh, every tide every time you were going to start fishing and uh, you would draw there and so there was a premium on having fast boats. The guys in Alsuna were using big V8 engines when the rest of us were using Chrysler crowns because if you got a low number on that drift you wanted to get have a fast boat to get to one of the other drifts where you could get the net overboard. So, but they, it was, uh, they had like uh, 12 drifts and I think there was like 36, 37 boats on there. But they went all the way from Pillar Rock to Tongue Point, that story. So there were 12, 12, 12 different drifts. A lot of fish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again. Uh, I'm happy to talk about my recollections at McGowan. Um, I was born in 1948, and so my recollections are really relatively recent compared to what Irene and Kent are talking about for the other people that have done in-depth history about the fishing industry. Um, and I really am in a very luxurious position because I'm not an expert and I can always defer to the experts, but I can <laughs> talk about what I remember or what people told me. Uh, but I'm not really the one that has to do the labor to dig it all out like I read them. So very appreciative of that. Same with uh, Sydney and same with uh, the Pacific County uh, Historical Society. They did an issue on McGowan, I'm thinking maybe in the 60s by Charlie Cole. Yeah, yeah. Long, long time ago. Long time ago, but kind of the linkage of the, the string of pearls that comes along with with having six generations in one site, and it's just great, it's been a great legacy. Uh, Robin Taylor, same category. Uh, his grandfather and father fished for the McGowans, I believe. In fact, we've got a family lore story about, I believe it's how uh, Robin's grandfather um, was, was lost um, during a storm, and we didn't know uh, if he did, he'd survive, but, he was offshore, and he was just waiting out the storm before he wanted to come back in, uh, which was a safe thing to do, but it was nerve-wracking for everybody onshore, and obviously for him. But he had recently, his wife had recently given birth to, I think, Brick. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, 
everybody's distraught. But two or three days later, he shows up and says, everything's fine. I just didn't want to risk it during the storm. And sorry to disturb everybody, but breathe easy. And it just, it's a great story for a lot of reasons. Um, Dick Wallace, uh, he's going to talk about Derby, though. But I've got a, a warm spot in my heart for Dick and his wife, Ellen. Dick married my wife and I at McGowan Church. Oh. Performed the ceremony as deacon. Uh, Ten years ago, eleven years ago, and, and so I was married. Uh, all those yeah. roses. Yeah. Another, <laughs> another, another nice language. So pretty glad to be part of that. Uh, I'm going to hand out these uh, laminated pictures and articles. One is an article from 1973 in the Shinnecock Observer or the Story, Story. Uh, when my grandmother Mabel McGowan died. And my mom was interviewed to talk a little bit about her history, provided some pictures, and it's kind of self-explanatory, but we'll go ahead and start that around if you want. The other one is an interesting picture from 1928. It's actually two pictures that were crafted together as light box photography. They were old and weathered, and they patched them up. But it's a view west from the top of an oil derrick in 1928 at the McGowan site. And you can see the entire township, you can see the railroad, you can see the railroad track, you can see the road, you can see the church, you can see the pier, uh, you can see North Head in the distance. And it looks like there's a little snow on the ground, maybe a little uh, smattering of snow, so probably in the winter. And you can see what buildings were there in 1928. The cannery at McGowan closed in 1930 and everything moved to Iwaka where there was a better labor force and a lot more modern uh, arrangement. So McGowan kind of went dormant in 1930. Um, and also was the end of the railroad. The Clamshire Railroad ran from Megler to Iwaka to Nakata. Uh, shut down in 1930 and uh, automobile and truck transportation took over everything. The ferry from uh, the Washington shore to Astoria uh, ran until 1966. That's one of the memories we've got. Uh, we would ride a ferry to Astoria and loved doing that. Uh, it was always a fun adventure and we could run up and patronize the coffee shop and have a donut and, and pop and then pie. whatever was the pie and have a great time with that. And then, uh, it was only about a half hour trip, so it was fun to, to do that. The other vivid memories I've got are uh, Dan Wielden, uh, who was Dan Wielden's grandfather. Dan Wielden is local realtor now here in, in the Long Beach area. His grandfather is also Dan Wielden. He operated a camp at McGowan in the 50s and 60s that we would go to as kids just to watch him operate. It was a fishing camp called Camp Gallon, but the unique thing about it was he had a boat launch across the road into the river right at the crown of the highway. So it was a crowded arrangement, but it was a, uh, a cradle lift type arrangement for small boats, but people loved to fish off that site. And as young kids, we would just be enchanted to watching people boats launch and then recover in the afternoon and, and watch them process their fish and celebrate and maybe have a beer. But it was a hazardous operation both for your boat, for the operators, and for the traffic and for anybody running back and forth. <coughs> Dan Wheelman had a, a bay shack, a little shell, gas station, camping sites. There were two dormitory buildings that were left from the old McGowan cannery days. They're in that picture. Uh, and either retired school teachers or um, actual school teachers that were still teaching from a cell would come down uh, for the summer fishing season, run a restaurant and a lunch counter in that dormitory building, and they would, would make fresh donuts in the morning. Mm -hmm. So we were just a magnet over there for the first building. That was a hot uh, ass. Other vivid memories. <clears throat> My grandma died in 1973 at age almost 101. But we came down from school 
1966, in Thanksgiving, me and two of my buddies, and we had a few beers, and we were downstairs in the McGowan house. My, my grandma was upstairs sleeping, and we got in a big argument about the Vietnam War. And we started yelling at each other, and didn't, didn't go to violence or anything like that, but we were shouting. And, uh, and we heard ground pound on the, on the upstairs <laughs> of the, the stairwell for the broom handle or something and caught our attention. She goes, listen, you guys, shut up and go to bed. <laughs> and so we were scolded by, at that time, Grandma would have been, uh, you know, 95. <laughs> so we were, we were told to go to bed, which we did. I'm sure the conversation will resume later. Uh, that's a good memory. The other good memory is um, Grandma donated land to the Washington State Parks Association in 1955 because they approached her about doing a little bit of Clark monument at McGowan near the church. And uh, they said that the Lewis and Clark journals are pretty clear that they probably camped in this vicinity uh, a number of days, probably 10 days on the North Shore around McGowan. After dismal days, they stayed at Middle Village. And the history hadn't been developed as fully as it is now and interpreted and really verified. Um, and Fort Clatsop had really gotten all the glory about Lewis and Clark. It's mostly a south side of the river story, but Washington was a little neglected. So the Washington officials wanted to kind of highlight what had happened on the North Shore. Since then, the National Park's been built. But in 1955, they did a little picnic area at McGowan uh, with a picnic table and a monument. And so we went over there and always we did pictures and mom was proud of that. So those were good things. The other thing, we would fish out of either Owaco or Chinook. Uh, we would usually go out of Chinook on a cannery tender out of the um, Chinook Packing Company, which was owned by our uncle, uh, Alan and Argyle, our aunt and uncle. Lee Timmons would take us out. Uh, Dad would love to come down fishing uh, with his friends and relatives. Um, and that was a, a nice occasion. Um, just lots of those kinds of stories for kids. So really enjoyed that. Um, the last thing I'll say is my uncle, uh, Reese Williams, my dad's oldest sister's husband, um, was asked to be the chairman of the Pacific County Pioneer Picnic in 1955. And he wanted to be held. I think they're going to have the picnic up at Bruce, Bruce Port, maybe, in the uh, South Bend area. And so he called Al Guile, who was a good friend, and said, Al, would you be willing to do the keynote, keynote speaking at the Pioneer Picnic in 1955? And Al said, well, Reese, I don't really consider myself an old timer or a pioneer. I think my my dad or grandfather was a pioneer, um, and your dad or grandfather was a pioneer, but we're not pioneers. And we said, well, Al, my dad has been gone for 25 years. Your dad has been gone for 35 years. I would love to have them be the street. <laughs> Uh, community that had abundant fishing, 
um, and was just a great natural setting, but to get to it was, was very difficult. Uh, you know, water access first, but, uh, which was, we had kept it isolated, but it did have deep water out in front. So there was more mortgage available if they wanted to do that, or if you go to the dock, you could have ferry service, which they did from, from Astoria. Um, then the railroad came and really opened things up because the railroad was the link of commerce that provided not only access up and down the peninsula, but along the uh, you know, uh, Fort Columbia, McGowan, and Maybird, but also Astoria. Once you get to Astoria, you have a railroad to Fort or a uh, steamboat, um, TJ Potter. So it linked up and it was opened up uh, from geographic isolation uh, to really be able to flourish with the new bridge. Uh, that was the culmination. But in terms of a town, we had a number of residences. We had dormitories for the work crew. We had a Chinese work crew house uh, with Chinese labor. We had a church that's still there. We had a school, um, and there was a small company store uh, where you could buy uh, some goods. So that was part of it, and very much a cohesive little town. But because it was such a limited population and kind of seasonal, they couldn't continue the manufacturing um, at the Canada because they needed a, a more stable workforce and better supply routes. So everything I went to, I went to Milwaukee, or other locations for the McGowan Cannery. And then the McGowan Cannery closed in 1945. The assets were sold off and the four brothers dissolved the company. Luckily, my mom's family got to stay on the property. The rest of that property in Milwaukee and elsewhere and sold that. But it, she stayed in, in, uh, at McGowan at the old donation land claim that goes back to 1860. Interesting story. Yes. As you would go from, I suppose, the modern landmark would be the bridge there. Going west, what are the towns along there? What are the line up the towns? Well, Dick would probably put the line more. It start right there with Chinookville or Derbyville, right at the bridge. Point Ellis is what they'd call it. Uh, but Chinookville goes all the way back to Washington Territory, Oregon Territory. Um, Washington Hall was there, a donation land claim was there. It was actually the first county seat of the uh, Pacific County during territorial days. Chinookville and then Oysterville. Second one. Second one. Uh, because uh, Pacific, Pacific City. Pacific City, okay, the second yeah. one. Um, so it's jumped around a little bit. Um, uh, Swan talks about Chinookville in the book. But then Chinookville, McGowan, Fort Columbia, Chinook, uh, and then really El Waco, Seaview. So we go to Seaview. So the McGowan, uh, yeah, they basically did the land from so about basically the 1860s. That's right, donation land. Yeah. We don't know, we tried to find copies of the uh, DLC, and I guess it's probably available in the archives. We're not sure if it's. Uh, Abraham Lincoln signed all the, uh, the president signed all the donation land claims. And it was only about a 10 year period that the DLCs were available, 50s to the 60s, I think. And so it was either Lincoln, his predecessor, maybe Buchanan. Uh, but, um, yeah. so those were kind of historical documents. So were they 180 acres in those days? Uh, but typically it would be uh, 320 for each spouse, a total of 640. Uh, but ours was not that big because it was waterfront and it was, so it was not uniformly shaped. Um, it had Thailands and a hillside a, a, roughly a mile from the river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? What was the general population of these sort of simple seasonal economy? Um, I'm guessing that I would say 50 people, 75, uh, probably year round and during the summer, maybe a couple hundred. It's really good you explained about Chinookville because I think people think Chinookville was before Chinook. They think it was over there, and it, that's not where it was. On the other, no. on the other side of the tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly right. Different kind, different side of the tunnel. And the Fort Columbia story is an important one too. Uh, 
obviously a military installation. I think built during the Spanish-American War, like 1898. Uh, not as old as Fort Candy, but certainly old. And uh, that kind of resurrected activity and brought military presence to it in uh, marine traffic during World War I and World War II was active. They maintained it. They mined the Columbia River with a cable across from Fort Columbia to Fort Stevens uh, and was coastal artillery. So that was significant. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my question was about, you said uh, P.J. McCallum cannery at McGowan closed in 1930 and moved to Owango, and that one closed in 1945. Right. Was Keystone still McGowan cannery, or was that the one after? That was after. Okay, so that was the Lord right. Hammer. Correct. Uh, Correct. And the McGowan, uh, P.J. McGowan son company, dissolved in 1945, and one of the successor companies was the Keystone Cannery in Hillwood. Okay. But they kept the same site, the same building. Yeah, and then there was always a receiving station at McGowan. Uh, yeah, and probably uh, after 1930, they would even move that to probably Owanko. Uh, I don't think they had too much activity at McGowan. It was started to become just a ghost town. Mm -hmm. So when your mother was going to school, uh, that wonderful story, uh, the, the school is no longer at McGowan. She went to Chinook School, right? Right, she had to ride and, over the hills. And, she, and there was no tunnel then, there was no way, and there was no way around. Right. So what was the name, Yitz, what was, what was the name of the driver of the car? I don't know the name, but I know I, you wrote about the story. I can't, I can't remember the name, but uh, Bill's mother told me the story. Okay, so they went, it, he had an old, uh, probably a Model A, and uh, she said it had Isinglass, um, you know, size. So, and so yeah, I don't know how many kids went to school, maybe three, and he would drive them over the hill and uh, and it was just a narrow road. So if by chance, which didn't happen very often, a car was coming the other way, uh, whoever was going up or back or down and, uh, and uh, she said she was terrified. Terrified every time. So terrified that she wrote a will. She was six. <laughs> pictures that I found. Um, my dad used to, used to take a lot of uh, Super 8 uh, movie, like no sound, just, just uh, this is in the old days. And uh, I was trying to find it and, and bring that with me, but I couldn't find it. <laughs> because I know he took some pictures when we were out there fishing. Uh, in fact, he had me as I was about to old, seven, seven years old, eight years old maybe. And I caught my first salmon uh, out there off of Derbyville. That was in a little boat. So I'm going to pass some of these pictures around. Derbyville was pretty much where that campground or where the, where the trail park is right now. And they used to have a big sign up there, you know, the, where Captain Robert Gray came through and, you know, and the first person to come in the Columbia River and all that. Uh, and it was a, we had a building right along the road there on, on the, on the water side of Highway 101, not on, on the other side of Highway 101, there was camp. There was a uh, oh, cottages for people to stay in and so forth. And then on both sides, we cleaned it out real well. It's, it's not that way now. The blackberries and everything else is taken over now. But we cleaned it out real well, and, and it was a campground for people. So some. Uh, if they wanted to come fishing for a week or two or whatever it was, they could camp there. And we'd go around and, and collect. It was like 50 cents a night or something like that. <laughs> but uh, it was kind of fun. It was a little job for me to do. Uh, I was only, like I say, about eight, nine years old the years that I did it. Uh, 
Uh, my older brother David, he used to have one of the pictures you're going to see here, this one here, it kind of shows the boats going down and you'll see guys in the water, you know. Well, he used to wear a swimming suit all the time and he'd help launch the boats and then would recover them too. Um, so we made a little bit of money doing that in the summertime. It was a summertime work. But this is my uh, Ray Provo owned. Ray Provo was a logger here for years. Um, he lived in the house in Seaview, the really big house there that's now a bed and breakfast, I think. That was Grandpa's house, Grandma Grandpa's house. But uh, and he he uh, owned the property that I live on right now. I live on Bear River, about six miles out of town, five, six miles out of town. You know, big log home about a mile off the road, right along Bear River. I used to fish Bear River a lot. Ride my bicycle down to Bear River and catch steelhead, catch harvest trout, occasional salmon. I always had a good run of chum going up Bear River, but you don't see too much of it anymore. Um, anyway, I'm going to pass this around. This is my grandfather. Obviously, it's, it's a king salmon or a chinook because it's a big one. You guys want to look at it first and pass it around? Dick, was the, was the road as, uh, you know how it, there's all this riprap now, all the rocks. And yeah, stuff. right. What, right. What, that wasn't there. That wasn't there, and, no. And so it was wider there on the Yeah, side. it was wider, yeah, much wider. That's a lot yeah. of it's eroded away. Now it's, it's uh, I think it was moved in more so because the building that you're going to see that, that's in there, that was on the water side, and now there were pilings there that had to sit on. But that, uh, we, we sold tackle, um, there was a little restaurant in there that was laid to cook breakfast and lunch. A lot of guys would get uh, sandwiches to take with them, you know, when they went out fishing and so forth. So she was busy all the time. And we had a derby, that's why I guess it was called Derbyville. The derby usually started about mid-August and then ended on Labor Day weekend. And they give daily prizes of the biggest fish. It didn't cost much to enter the derby. Just about everybody that launched their boats there kicked in 25 cents, whatever it was, just to have their name in the derby. And then like the daily prize for the biggest fish brought in was like 50 bucks. 50 dollars back then was a pretty good deal. And then I think the, the grand prize for the biggest fish over the whole derby season was like $500, I think so. So it was, it was something for the people. And you know, when you see the, was it, the buoy 10 season, sometimes they used to say there's so many boats there you can walk across the river with them. Yeah. Well, that's the way this was. I mean, there, that, on the channel side, like the channel on this side, it was solid boats going up and down. And they were trolling, most of the time trolling, not, uh, not drifting, because tide coming in, tide going out, they'd be running into each other all the time. So I know when we went fishing out there, we always had a troller. So this is another, this is the picture I'm going to pass around that, that shows being launched. And then during the season that was not fishing season, like June, maybe early June, summertime, and then uh, we would put, we would put across the launching area a big log. See them sitting on the log here, and this is the, this is some family that came. My grandmother was uh, Scottish. She immigrated to Canada as an indentured servant when she was a little girl, like 14 years old, and and then she eventually ended up being brought by over here by her uncle, and her uncle was was uh, Willie Begg who happened to be on the Glen Morrie when it, when, it, uh, when, it, when it ran around up there at Ocean Park here. And Willie Begg stayed with the ship and then he married a lady up here at Ocean Park, Bob Taylor, Taylor Hotel. So anyway, that's how my grandparents got here. My grandmother came here, she was a nurse, she had nursing practice, she met her husband Ray who who broke his ankle on the, he was a logger and he, and he broke his ankle, so he obviously they fell in love and had six children. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this, this is visitors, my, my grandmother's visitors came to see her from Scotland. 
her sister's there, her niece and uncles are there, and, and so we had a big party out there at Der or out the, at Derbyville, you know. And of course, here's the, the kids of us. We love to go fish or swimming down there all the time. Uh, in fact, my mother had a big. We lived on Timmins Hill. I don't know if you guys know where Timmins Hill is. There were two houses there. Then one house is gone now. The other house we lived in there. And we had a big garden in the back. Well, we used to work in the garden. That was the deal. We'd work in the garden, pulling weeds, things like that. And then in the afternoon, it was a nice day, we'd go down to Derbyville and go swimming. And my dad would get off work. He, he worked for his, for his father-in-law, Bobbin. So he'd get off work and he'd see where we're gone. So he'd just continue, continue on down there and he'd join us. And we'd have a cookout there. So we spent a lot of time enjoying Derbyville in the area down This is another picture. It shows the log a little bit better than the people sitting on it. And then here's some more of the big, my, my relatives, all the beautiful ladies out there pulling her and just getting your feet wet. <laughs> uh, let's see what else is out there. What's that? I'm not quite sure where Derbyville was. Okay, well, you know where, where the McGowan house is? Yes. Yeah. Okay, just go down a little bit further toward the bridge, today's bridge. And so it's between the bridge and the McGowan place was pretty much Derbyville. Okay. It's about a quarter of a mile, half mile long that we use for camping. But where the present trailer park is, that you see now, it's called Park by the Bridge, I think is what it's called. And imagine cottages there. And then on the other side of the road, on the river side of the road, is where the, the building was that you see here with my grandfather holding the fish. That's where that was. Of course, that's all gone now. But uh, that's where that was. And then, I think my grandfather bought the property somewhere in the mid-40s. And we moved back up here in 1950. Summer of 1952. I know we moved up this summer because school hadn't started yet. And my dad had to go, he was still in the Navy, and he had to go to Korea. And when he got back from Korea, that's when he retired from the Navy, 22 years in the Navy. And then he went to work for my, for my grandfather, his father-in-law, okay? But, so, my old brother David was sort of like the, the head male of the family, you know, while dad was gone. And he was like seven years older than me, so he was a teenager, and he could go and work in the summer. And Grandpa had to work for him all the time. And uh, so he, he did that, and, and I remember he learned how to drive uh, the second year. Mom taught him how to drive. We had a great big Oldsmobile. Man, that thing was huge. Big old long flat, flathead V8 in the front. Anyway, uh, great memory. Just now. Uh, I know a few years ago, uh, I think September, the, a few uh, humpback whales followed the salmon into the river. Yeah. Uh, did you ever have anything like that? You know, I never saw a whale come in when I was a kid. Now, I've seen them since. I've seen them all the way up coming to the bridge, really. Uh, but I never remember, never remember whales as a kid coming in. So I don't know whether that's something new that they've been doing or what. Yeah. Yeah, what? Did you want to say that in, when the derby wasn't going on, that the log was moved in? That, that was, log was moved out. So, I, I don't know, it was like a very large log. A very large, a big fur tree. Did you wait for a tie and move it off? Oh, no, we had, Grandpa was a logger. He had the equipment to do it. Oh, okay. He'd bring the shovel in and we'd move the thumb around. And was that kind of just to save that spot on the riverside so no one else it was, it was to use to it? To keep people really from going down there on their own. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a liability yeah. issue, I guess. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But we, it was always moved away. Yeah. And then they'd open it up and we could launch it. Because yeah. they, we, we have to park their trucks and their cars and stuff. You notice there's cars pulling the little boats and and they do that across the road? Or yeah, we pop them across the road. Yeah. That's right. When did the, the break wall was in the north? What was the what? The break wall that's there now. 
that really got rid of the green dust. The, the, the right. riff raff, I guess yeah. they call it. Yeah. yeah. That's been hauled in by the state, and they've been doing that ever since Derbyville went away. They started building that up because they had too much water coming in um, during the storms, especially in the wintertime. Um, but uh, the stuff that they've got on there now, that's fairly recent. And, they get, and they've really been putting in big stuff so that it stays They're similar to what they have on the Jennies. Yeah. What, what years was, was Derbyville? Pardon me? What years was Derbyville from what to what? About? I'm guessing mid 40s to the 60, 61 maybe one way. So, Early so when, 60s did bridge, when did the bridge go in? 60, Pardon me? When did the bridge go in? 66? 66. So, so by yeah. 66, when the bridge went in, isn't that when they reorganized the road and put the river yeah. wrap in and yeah. all that? Yeah, because yeah. yeah. they had to take, make a wide end to make a turn there. And of course, they were putting the road in to, to that, all the way through there to Napa and the, beyond, where, beyond where the old ferry landing was. Was it was it a paved road when you were a kid? Um, yes and no. When I was a kid, the way they paved the road, not like they didn't have asphalt, what they do is they lay down some tar or whatever it was and then put really fine rock on it and roll over it and eventually it got all packed down. That's because I remember them doing that all the way in front of our place. And the bad thing about that is is um, sometimes your car would get splatters of uh, tar by running over it. Because uh, I remember cleaning our car sometimes after they did that. Yes? So Nancy Bell Anderson had her fish camp going the same time you guys did Derbyville. Uh, where was that at? That's the Mountain Cove site. Uh, Mountain yes. Cove? Oh, okay. I'm sure there was, was. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really, you couldn't drive over there though, right? No, uh, so they were isolated. Yeah, at first you, you could get around if you went around the May cell, come back around. I oh, thought okay. it's just that there was a section in there where the road wasn't didn't go through. And they were doing their fish camp the yep. same time you guys mm -hmm. were, right? Okay. And you know, I don't know that each of us really had. I mean, we had a lot of people there, and I'm sure they did too. There were a lot of fish coming in the river back then. Not as much as they, they, they seem now to come in and then shoot upstream right away. And they're late coming in, seems like. Uh, where we were fishing in the river in July. And now they don't even open, well, I have to open the 1st of July now, the ocean, but they don't open the river until later on. Well, John probably knows more about this too, but I just think it's funny that how they got their fish camp was really interesting. Uh, the one up in Napton? Yeah. yeah. Because no. her brother they were, saw an They ad. were summer teachers. I mean, they were teachers in Portland that came down. To oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. oh, all right. Well, her brother saw an ad in the back of like a, 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 a magazine, like a comic book kind of thing. It said, yeah. buy government property chief. And he talked to his dad. <laughs> Because they could buy the quarantine station, the old camera dock, all of that was government property. And they could buy it for, I don't know, was it a thousand dollars or something like that? And so he talked to his, his dad said, I don't want to spend that kind of thing. Well, look at it, it's going to be so cool. You can get this big piece of land and we'll make a fish camp down there and we'll do all this. And it's only a thousand dollars, Dad. And, and, uh, I guess he agreed to it. That was only one of many lifetimes at Napton Cove. Oh yeah. Was, uh, initially, it was a uh, native uh, village, and then it was a cannery. Yeah. And then it was the quarantine station. The quarantine US, station. Yeah. U.S. Immigration Service. Yeah. And then it was the fish camp, and um, it, now it's a private museum. Yeah, yeah, now it's the museum now. Yeah. Very interesting museum, by the way. Uh, any other questions? It was a lot of fun being involved with Derbyville, let me tell you, as a kid. 
you know, you get to go fishing. In fact, a lot, when the guys come back fishing, they clean their fish, okay? And just the seagulls around and all that. But they just throw back in the water and stuff. Well, that would attract a lot of, of uh, supper fish. Yeah. And, and we just catch supper fish. We let them go and catch supper fish. It was just, it, it was fun because it was something to do as a, as a kid growing up. You had a question back to here? Yeah. Um, and so on the east end, it, you access where we go on the east the end, east right? End. And go towards the west, towards, towards Fort Columbia. Could you go drive all the way down that little beach? We would drive all the way down from the, the tunnel, Fort right. Columbia, right? Yeah. And, then, could... and then down further toward the present day bridge. You remember? Astoria Bridge. Uh -huh. It was right before that. that where that trailer park is now. Right. That was all, and there were three logging roads that used to go up there to the, all the stuff. Because my grandfather logged back in that area, mm -hmm. and uh, and I used to go back there hunting as a kid. Uh, but there was three of them. There's one of them where there's a house living up there now. Uh -huh. There's one house on, and then there's another one. There's two houses up there now that I know. Yeah, right. Um, and. Both of them, I think, get by the same road. Uh, but we used to up those roads all the time. And the cottages came all the way down to where McGowan property started? No, there, there, there's some houses between McGowan and where we left off at. Uh, there's two or three houses in there. And then, so it's, I'd say, from the trailer park, it's probably a quarter of a mile down and then toward McGowan, and then the property stopped. Just like it was about a quarter of a mile the other direction. Uh -huh. So there's about a half a mile strip in there that they had. And it went back until it started going up the hill. I mean, the hill was pretty sharp. At one time, I don't know if you remember this, there was a, a rock pit there. Remember? Right. It's all grown up now. But I remember one time where we were stopped. We were going to go on the ferry to Astoria, and we were stopped right about McGowan. And because they were blasting, and, and they had to wait, wait. That was fun to watch that. Because <laughs> they drilled in, they drilled in, and then the guy did the, you know, the turn again. Yeah. And boom, you know, rocks going every which way. <laughs> so they, they, but that's all grown up now, the trees and stuff like that. Now. The, uh, the exhibit at the museum in Iwako of Derbyville with old photographs. I'm sure you're aware of that. Yeah. And uh, the question, um, wasn't there an orchard on the water side uh, of the highway, an old orchard? On the water side? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. It could have been. Yeah. It could have been. Think because there was more was a flat, sand. Flat and, yeah, there was a flat area there. Not so much like it is now. Right. Mm -hmm. Other questions? introduce you. Uh, I want to go back to McGowan for a minute because what another funny story about McGowan is when you told him on you were going to go look for the old oil rig and she said and look for the orchard. Right. Tell them. She said uh, when I got there when we found an old uh, oil side of the oil well that had been abandoned. It was a well that didn't produce any oil. It was abandoned, just a dry hole. But there was a few little uh, concrete pedestals that were there used during the, when the derrick was built. Uh, they were all overgrown. Um, it was hard to find. We kind of dug out and found it. I came back and said, yeah, you can still see the side, but it's pretty well overgrown. She goes, were there any apple trees around there? And I said, yeah, there were some apple trees. Why? She goes, well, I remember when I was a kid, I would go over there and watch the oil well. And all the workers at lunchtime would have a lunch bucket, and they'd have apples in their lunch bucket, and they'd throw the apple core out. And I figured, <laughs> <laughs> an apple bucket. And oh, there were. So. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, this is Pat Shank, and um, and I probably didn't make myself clear when I talked to you, or between the two of us old people, we got screwed up. 
and he thought it started at 12, so you're in plenty of time. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, perfect timing, really, because Pat is going to tell us a little bit about sports fishing, and um, we've uh, uh, learned about commercial fishing and all kinds of things, and so now it's time for you to tell us about your business of how many years? Uh, I, I started fishing with my dad when I was 10, for about 67 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, was, this is, this is, I, I share everybody's familiar with the Columbia River Bar. Mm. Oh, I've, I've been across the bar 11,000 times. <laughs> As long as God passes around. <laughs> well, this is actually a picture taken by uh, a good friend of mine uh, off the North Jetty. And he was, oh. The Coast Guard was working out there. And so uh -huh. you can see the type of water that is on it. It yeah. looks like you can some kind of your life. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my very early beginnings because sports fishing to me made a huge difference in my life. So, when I was in the first grade, somebody asked me what my dad did. And I didn't know because my dad worked three jobs. And so, I didn't really hardly know him. And uh, when I was 10, my dad got a charter boat out of Astoria. And we worked out of a place called Pacific Coast Charters. And uh, we had a 23-foot Owens. And it was such a small boat that if we had over five people in it, we had the thermos corks and the scuppers so it wouldn't sink. You know? <laughs> and uh, we ran out of that story and, and we'd go out and fish around the south and we never got out past Bully Four. And but it was, you know, it was just a fun experience. And, and the big thing about it is that I got to go with my dad, and I hadn't really been there. And the, the years from 10 to 18 were the best years of my life. And we had such great times together. And we experienced all kinds of water. We, we hit a wave much bigger than that one I'm showing you. And we said our goodbyes before it hit us. We were up on the fly bridge of a 33 foot boat. And that wave was coming like this, and here we were. Mm -hmm. And we broke through it like this and filled about 20 feet straight down. Oh. <laughs> and it was, uh, before that, we looked at each other and we thought we were done. You know? mm -hmm. And then he sent me down the bow to secure the anchor because it broke loose. <laughs> and it went overboard, we would have that. Mm -hmm. And then I hit the next wave, and I had him under the bow wheels up there and went underwater. But uh, I, I think my fingerprints are still. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got started, or how I got started. And as a sophomore in high school, I knew what I wanted to do. So I wanted to be a fisherman, I wanted to teach school. And it worked perfectly, you know, the two jobs. The only problem is she never had to pay off in 30 years. <laughs> she just went for one for the next. So at any rate, that's how we got started in the sporting industry. And in the mid-50s is when I started with my dad. And it was, it was great. You know, we just loved it. And the sports industry is a, a entertainment business. You know, it's not just catching fish, but it's entertaining. And my, my uh, Major in school was theater arts. <laughs> so it worked out well, you know. And we caught a lot of fish, but the main thing is to have, show people a good time. And so that's what we, we tried to do and made sure we could do that. Um, so my folks had a charter office. We had Columbia Bar Charters in Milwaukee, Washington for a long time. And my wife, worked in the office with me and my mother. And we had to send 150 people out every morning. And it was crazy. And 
Yeah, what, what I lived up in DuPage's hardware store up there in the apartments. And in the summertime, the line of cars coming in and, and trailers and stuff were just stacked up clear down the highway, probably past it up. And they're just coming in like crazy. And people would be lined up for double trips and, and you know, they'd come in morning and, and it was that booming business, you know, it was just wonderful. And then in the late 70s, Judge Bolt decision came through. And the Bolt decision had to deal with the Indian uh, you know, rights to the fisheries and stuff. And, and we went from, in 1966, I made 166 trips in a row. Mm -hmm. So it, it was, you know, it's crazy because that's over five months. And you see all kinds of water, that's why you see, you know, we've been across that bar so late. But uh, the industry had at that time about 150 charter boats in it, out of the port. And they were, it was just a huge business. And within just a few years after the boat decision, it went down to about 50. And then we're down to right now, it's about we have seven boats on the office side running in. Um, I think Pacific Salmon has four boats, and, and Butch of Coho has about three boats. Hmm. And that's what's happened to it. From uh, just the restrictions of the fisheries and that. And that. Plus, in the late 70s, the interest rates, uh, people had boats there that. that you know, they thought about uh, uh, the variable interest rates because it was cheaper. And they went up to 20%. Yeah, and that's what wiped out the food. You know, it just, uh, because they, the seasons were cut short. We went from 166 days to as little as 12 days mm -hmm. in some years. You know, it was really restricted, so it's, uh, it's kind of that interesting, you know, phenomena how it happened that way. But the high interest rates in the late 70s just about wiped everybody out. And uh, so, but now it's still, you know, we still keep busy. I still have two boats that I have. I have the Four Seasons and the Legacy. And we keep pretty busy during the summer. So it's still a viable industry, but it's you can see how the numbers have been cut back. And I think the uh, nature of, of our society now, kids are doing more video games and, and, you know, fishing isn't such a big deal anymore for a lot of people. You know, the, the dads don't take their kids fishing anymore. It's kind of a loss, you know, it's just a change for society. And, and uh, so it's, it's a little different. We still have a lot of people that want to go fishing, but it's not like the numbers we had before. So. And you still have a lot of fun, I bet, too, huh? What's that? And you still have a lot of fun, too, I Well, they do, yeah. When they come out, everybody has a great time. And as they, you know, we went to having to throw fish back all the time because you could only keep a marked fish, <coughs> a hatchery fish, so the babies you couldn't keep. And it used to be that we could catch, you know, in the 60s, or in the mid 70s, we were catching 50 salmon a day on the boats with the three fish limit and the boats were full. And then, but a lot of people, you know, the fish would be so good that a lot of people would catch a pinch out of 50 fish, you know, that somebody might not catch anything. And the only complaint you ever had was when the fish was really good. <laughs> you know? and, and sometimes they look around and say, geez, we're going back in, I don't even have a fish scale. You know, so it's just, I have a hard time saying these shoes, they're a different shoe in there. Like, I don't have any, I have a diabetic, I've been one for 57 years, so I don't have any feeling in my legs or knees or feet, and so I have a hard time keeping my balance so that. If it seems like you can sit. Yeah, no, I'm good. I, I can 
understand. It was just, we don't want to it just makes a, a little <laughs> awkward standing here for me. So, uh, but at any rate, so we've been visiting, and it's a great business. I love it. I don't charge anymore by diving. It's finally got the best of it, so I can't uh, take people out anymore. Man. But uh, I just quit a couple of years ago, and but I still have the boats. I have skippers. And I've been working on the boats in the shed here for the last month here, just trying to get them ready to go. So there's a lot of maintenance and going through the Coast Guard and they change the rules every year. So it's, it's a little tough. But, uh, it's been a great life. I love every second of it. It's, so somebody says, well, gee, you know, when was your last vacation? I said, my last vacation was 1977. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, teaching school and, and uh, fishing is like a vacation all day long. So, all day long. So, it's, it's great. I love both jobs. It was perfect. I've had a great life, and the sports fishing industry gave that to me. So, and uh, when we came to El Waco, sports fishing really weren't real popular at the time. <laughs> you know, it was a commercial industry, but we got along with everybody and respected everybody for what they did, and, and anybody who, who makes a living on the ocean, it's a tough life, it's dangerous, and it, it can be really hard, and I don't, but I don't regret a bit of it, it's just so much fun, and, and so enjoyable, and it's almost, uh, I'm out on the ocean, and you're kind of by yourself out there, it's so serene and beautiful, and, and it's just almost heavenly. You know, you just think, of, where else would I want to be? <laughs> so for a lot of us, it, it was, it, it's just super. And it's something that gets in your blood, you just don't want to ever stop. <laughs> you know? So I can still go out fishing, I just don't want to go to and I got a chance to raise my boys, you know, they, all through the summer, when kids get in trouble, you know, they were out fishing every day, and I started when they were six and five. <laughs> so, they were out with me every day from then on. And I had three boys and a daughter. And uh, one of my favorite stories is, is my daughter who, we went out on a second trip just to take the kids out fishing. And the boys have been deck hands and fishing all that time. And my daughter was about eight at the time, Alicia. And uh, she caught close to fish. <laughs> and, and, and the boys were just like this. You know? And she was like, oh no, not another one, Daddy. <laughs> so, there, so. And, and then, of course, I want to tell you this story just because it's my dad who tried to put a bath on the table there in the, in the cabin. Didn't turn out right, you know, so he had that chart there and he had varnished it and stuff, but it didn't look great. So he turned the table over. So I'm out there in the fog, and we're in 70 fathoms of water, which is quite a ways offshore. Wind's blowing, and, and you can't see anything. In those days, all we had was a, a compass and a depth sounder. And I sit there and I'm trying to figure out it's time to go in. And I don't know where I am. You know, I'm trying to get an idea. So my customers in the cabin of the boat, I said, can you move out of the table here for a second? I crawled under the table. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to get my bearings to figure out where 70 pounds of water was and how to run a course home. And, and then I, I come out there and I run three hours. And I never saw a thing for three hours in the fog. And you know you're living good because after three hours in the fog, there's the tip of the South Jetty right in front of me. <laughs> Yeah, still, life is good. Was, uh, no, we had to run. I, all we had in the early days, when I first started fishing, was just a, a compass and a, a Ross depth sounder, and that was it. You know, we didn't have all the fancy electronics they have now. Now, things are pretty easy. 
<laughs> in the early days, it was it was tough to navigate. So, but anyway, any questions at all? Or just about the sports industry or anything? We had a lot of students that were folk hands, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I went to high school in you know, Yeah. School. Yeah. Um, but Kelly Warren. Do you remember oh Kelly? yes. She yeah. Was, she was in my class. Oh yeah. yeah. She did for me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She's a she, sweetheart. And the, the uh, oh, was the attorney? Well, Pat, I yes. think uh, you should have been here when Irene was here. Irene, blow your car. When she was here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. This, this is what you're going to do. Oh, 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 a little load, not very good. I was ready to for Skip Wilson out of his office in the first year of Saturday. I was 18 when I first started chartering, so I wasn't very old. But when you're 18, you can do anything. You know? <laughs> so I thought there was both that uh, he had me read one day, this little Chris Craft, probably in 1930 something. It was really, and I, I get out there, it doesn't even have a compass on it. Yeah. <laughs> and, so I, I'm looking at the wind direction when I'm going out before we hit the fog. And uh, so I, I could maybe do a reverse course, you know, with the wind that doesn't change the whole day. And so I'm in the channel, and because you blew that fog horn, I'm sitting there and listening in the channel and we're fishing out, I hear this, you know. I said, ooh, this ship coming. Couldn't see it because I didn't have any. Get rid of it. Oh, and then here. Mm, <laughs> and, and I'm pushing, and these two ships are going like this. Great. Oh. And I can almost reach out and touch both of them. <laughs> and of course, I was out there when the middle got hit by that ship. And I heard that. I could hear the crash when the, the dredge got hit. It was about a few years ago now. That happened out there. That was right there. And this is Listen. fun? <laughs> getting towed in one time by the Coast Guard and the Molly Brown, which was a little 26 foot in East Bay, one of the biggest boats ever. No, it's, it's not a big boat. But, and they're, I get towed in and, and it's foggy again. And I could hear this, this ship coming. You know, you could hear, I'm looking at it and the Coast Guard didn't see it on the tow line. They're up there. I look at the ship is coming right at me. You know, I'm going, so I get up on the bow and I'm going on the toll line like this. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's, I got a thousand stories. <laughs> a lot of them are, are kind of fun. You know? And you're here to tell? <laughs> I, I was going out on the mall ground again, that big page paper. So. And, we had the electronics, that's those, those early days when we had the electronics. And I could hear breakers in the main channel. I tried to get out the north side. I could hear breakers on the spit. And so you're just kind of listening and going out and for the breakers to stop on the right side. And so, And then as soon as I couldn't hear the breakers anymore, I knew I could turn up across the peacock spit. And, and as soon as the baby turned, the motor stopped, the engine came up, got on fire. <laughs> so, you know, little things like that. <laughs> little things, I'm still here. <laughs> it's all worked out okay. But uh, yeah, we've had all kinds of things out there that happen. You go out there many times, so, and they have all kinds of stories. So, that's all they want. Do you recommend if somebody joins your. Uh Charter that uh, we get life insurance first. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have life insurance. I don't. <laughs> I'm a diabetic. I wouldn't give me life insurance. I figured that's a good thing. My wife would take care of me that way. <laughs> We've only been married 57 years, so and had four kids. And Enrique makes five because we had adopted one, and so. 
It's just been a great life. I tell you why. I, sports fishing and the teaching just gave me the best life possible. I can't imagine. I'm one of the luckiest people I've ever met. And, so, and, and I went to, to the fishing and, and teaching. What did, all did you teach, Pat? I taught. I started out teaching speech and debate. Having I mean, grants passed in Southern Oregon. And then when I moved to Alaco, which was in 71, but I, I fished here way before that. But I moved here and I got a job at the school of it. And I, the first job opening was teaching uh, junior high. And if you survive one year of junior high, they never let you out. <laughs> That's right. I taught. The first thing I taught was was uh, English and uh, writing, which were probably not my strength, but I survived. And then I ended up teaching a lot of math. That's what I taught. And even though I didn't major in math, math was one of those things that always gave me easy for me. So, so you knew Mr. Quimby? Oh, yes. Mrs. Beard? Mrs. Beard, Mr. Man over by fishing buddy, because he also chartered. And uh, yeah, I've been here for a while. <laughs> had a lot of kids and had a lot of success there. So it's, it's just been wonderful. And uh, I finally retired from teaching and then I retired from fishing. And so now I go out and play golf in the morning. And, uh, well, thanks. Yeah, Thank you. you.